Assembly of God. My name is Mike Tyler and my family and I are missionaries in Germany and I want to thank you guys for taking a few minutes to check out a little video we made to share about our ministry, where we've been and where we're going. And before you guys see that video, I just want to take a minute and just say thank you for praying for the people of Germany just as we are praying for the people of Fort Myers. Pastor Matt was telling me about your, the sale of your property and just some of the vision that he has for your church. And I just want to say we're praying for you guys and believing God with you for what he wants to do through your church. So please take a minute, a few minutes, check out our video. And then afterwards, I'm going to bring you back here into the woods and explain to you why in the world I'm standing in the woods. How do I say Thank you, Lord, for the way that you love, and the way that you come, for all that you've done, and all that you're doing. My heart pulls out Thank you You don't have to come
So guys, thanks so much for taking a few minutes to check out our video and hear what you're doing, hear what we've been doing. As you heard, we're church planters. We love reaching people with the message of the gospel. But you know, sometimes when you're trying to plant a church, it's really hard to get people into the doors of the church. And that's why I'm standing in the woods because God's given us other tools as well to reach people of all different shapes and sizes and kinds who might not come into a normal church building. So I'm using the ministry of the woods and the ministry of something like this in the woods. We're starting a special project. I'm trying to raise some funds, about $3,000, so I can build up a supply of gear and some cash so that I can take guys out on trips, invite them to go out backpacking in the woods so we can really connect and we have time to talk about the Lord. You know, our lives are such a busy rush of events happening one after another that it's rare to have hours upon hours with a bunch of guys where I can just challenge them to go after Jesus. But I get to do that when I'm backpacking, when I'm hiking. And so I'm raising some gear so I can invite guys to come along and say, you don't need anything, you don't need to buy anything, just come. And we'll go and we'll connect with each other and we'll be connecting with God in his creation the whole time. Thanks so much for taking a few minutes to hear about the heart of our ministry. We're praying for you guys. God bless you. Amen. Pastor Matt and myself have been communicating with Michael Tyler and... This is the project that he wanted to do with our church in particular because we were challenging him to say, give us something. We want to participate. And he prayed about it, and this is what he's working on, and we want to support what he's doing. Amen? So uh, at the end of this service, what we're going to do is take another offering. And if you have the ability to do that today and give to this project, thank you. But as the Lord works on your heart uh, through this service. Maybe you can't do it today, but you could write down on a pledge card something that you would like to give in the future towards this project. You let us know what God's doing through you, and we'll make sure that the funds get into his hands. And I want you to know every Assembly of God missionary that we have stationed around the world, uh, they do not have jobs, as it were, in the countries where they live. They are fully supported by the church. That is, the churches all over the United States give to these missionaries so that they can spend their full time working with the people, learning the language, and creating a church where there was no church. And as you can see, uh, Michael Tyler is doing that very thing. Packed up his family from the states here and went to a place he did not know, learned the language that he did not know to communicate with the people that he did not know so that they could know Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? So that is this month's mission, the right mission. We want to make sure that we're concentrated on the right mission. There are all sorts of missions that people have in store for you. You can donate your money in any wide direction, especially this time of year. You will see commercials for all sorts of needs. There are needs all over the planet. There are different groups raising money for different needs. What you need to do and what I need to do is say, God, what is the right mission? Where do you want me to give sacrificially so that your glory might be accomplished in the earth? Amen? Um, I'm not saying that charity in general is bad. I believe it is the idea of God that people would share resources. But we learn of some charities that are not charities that are at all. They are set up as organizations that take money from people and it never goes where it's supposed to go. I want you to know there's complete accountability in the assemblies of God. Every dollar that we collect, you can follow it all the way to the missionary that you have pledged it to. And that is the way we like to do it. Up front, out in the open so that you can track what God is doing through your giving. So please consider that as we go through this service today, the right mission. Before he was a missionary, he was a Bible college student. And like many college students, they have to go to chapel on a regular basis. That is that you go to church Monday through Friday on the campus of your Bible college. And this particular individual's name is Jim Elliott. While in Bible college, sitting there taking notes in chapel one day, he wrote this quote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm going to say it again because it's a deep concept. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain 
that which he cannot lose. That was written by student Jim Elliott in 1949. He was a bright spot on his Bible college campus. He was contagious, as it were. Many people thought that he would be an American revivalist preacher because we know in the 1950s as he would be transforming out of studenthood into real life as a preacher that there was a desperate need for revival in this country. We were at a place of either going one way or the other. And this individual thought to himself, I just, I just want to give myself to what God wants me to do. Everybody on campus knew he was going to be an American revivalist preacher bringing fresh fire and fresh wind to the American church and creating revivals all over this great country. But instead, he, in prayer, approached four of his other friends in Bible college and was considering going to Ecuador. Ecuador was a place that desperately needed God. In fact, it was told of them that the Akan Indians, that, that's a word that means naked savages, needed the gospel message. And so he, in prayer with his four other friends, said, let's, let's go to Ecuador and give ourselves to the will of God, that these naked savages could hear the gospel and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. When he presented this idea to his friends, Jim Elliott, they were all for it. They felt the call of God on their life to become missionaries. However, people around them weren't quite as enthused. Because if you think you have an up and rising American revivalist and that person tells you, no, I'm not stationed to the America of the United States, I'm stationed to South America, God wants me to go meet the savages of this world and preach the gospel to them. You can imagine the letdown. Many people on campus with him, many people that knew and had heard Jim Elliott's preaching said of him at the time, that he was wasting his time and throwing away his life to minister to the violent group of savages in South America. Can you imagine that that was the thought process of the churches around him and the people that knew him best? Jim Elliott, you're going to throw your life away to a group of people that don't care about you. Along with him was a friend by the name of Pete Fleming, Pete Fleming was also, like Jim Elliott, willing to do a great work. Jim Elliott was not of the preacher type. He was a professorial type. He was a deep theological guy. He loved to study the pages of Scripture, and many thought he's going to be a great Bible college professor one day. He's going to give back to our students one day here on the Bible college campuses of America. And many great theological works will be written by him. We can't wait for him to graduate. And when he announced to his friends and family, I'm not going to become a professor. I'm going to go to Ecuador with my friend Jim Elliott. <clears throat> and we're going to give ourselves to the Aachen, savage, naked people of the woods and preach the gospel to them. You know what his friends and family and churches around him and other professors thought of that idea? Sir, you're throwing away your life to a group of savages <clears throat> who will not uh, appreciate your abilities. Why would you do such a thing when you've been so gifted why would you throw yourself to the savages when there are people here in this country that can use and appreciate your abilities? Along with him was another man by the name of Ed McCauley, Nate Saint. These guys like to fly planes. These guys just had an affinity for getting planes in the air and approached them, Jim Elliott, and says, you know what, we need some pilots 
to get us over the ground so we can see what's going on below, so we can track what the savages are doing and learn what God wants us to do. And you know what these two guys said? We're in. You know, when you're a pilot, I mean, you're in this country. You know, pilots, they, they, they were heroes in this country at one time. It, it was the prime job to get. And if, if the private industry didn't get you, certainly the United States Air Force really wanted you. And they wanted you to, to fight for your country or fly for the prestige of this nation. Certainly these men, if they were just going to fly over missionary grounds, were throwing away their careers for savages who would not appreciate what they were up to. And the last individual, Roger Yodoran, was simply a man with a calling on his life to preach. Just as talented as the rest of the group, people around him said, you're throwing away your life if you go preach to the savages of Ecuador. These gentlemen, their story is simple. On January 8th, 1956 in Ecuador, they were murdered by the Wadani tribe, just as all of their friends and family had predicted. This was a violent tribe of Indian warriors, and these missionaries were speared to death by this violent tribe of people. And you might be sitting in your seats thinking the same thing. What a waste. What a waste. Except that God was up to something in their sacrifice. And indeed, it was the right mission. And the wives of these missionaries decided that their husbands did not die in vain. And they decided that although our husbands were murdered, we're going to continue to pray for these people, we're going to continue to love these people, and we're going to continue to minister to these people. And these five wives decided, we're going to go. And you know what? And they went. And they began to preach. And they were receptive to the gospel. And they were so shocked and amazed. And they said, why why were you so receptive to us bringing the gospel, but you were so hate-filled to kill our husbands? And they said, well, you don't, you don't understand. The day we murdered your husbands, there were angelic beings up in the mountains all around where we murdered. And they were there standing watch, and we were so afraid that we did something wrong, that we were waiting for the next set of missionaries to come tell us so that we could repent of our wrong and turn our lives over to Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, what the world calls a waste, God says, I have a way to expand it larger than what you think it is. One person dies, but an entire tribe gets saved. The son of Nate Saint is a gentleman by the name of Nick Saint, and he would go along with his mother to learn the missions as a nine-year-old boy, and the man that murdered his father officially adopted him into the tribe and taught him how to be a man. Can you imagine? Can you imagine all of this Terrible, horrific events that turns out for the salvation and turning of a group of people that these men, age 28, age 27, age 28, age 32, and age 31, had the wherewithal to say yes. Not knowing the price that they would pay with their lives. You can, if you would like, rent this Buy this, download this movie. It's called The End of the Spear. It tells the mission of Jim Elliott and his friends. The real life story of people who are willing to sacrifice and give their all. Now I have a question for you in this room. How does God get ordinary people to abandon themselves to an otherwise successful life to give it up to preach Jesus? How do you get ordinary people to shift 
and move and be willing to sacrifice their all so that some might receive the gospel. Because the Wadani tribe, it's not a large group of people, but these five men gave their lives for this small group of people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think they are heroes in the great by and by. I think when we meet them one day, I think they're lined up alongside Jesus in the great by and by, and we're going to meet them one day. He's like, it's people like this that are the heroes, people who are willing to lay their life down on the line and give sacrificially. So as I searched the scriptures, I said, God, what is the key? You've got to show me what the key is to unlock inside of us, to break through selfish living so that we can live a life that is a sacrifice for others in that you are glorified. Amen? Do you want to know what the secret is? Do you want to know what God revealed to me? I can feel the anticipation in the room. Look, we gave you a whole seat. You only need the edge. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter number 24. The answer is nestled into this passage of a communication with a great leader and king by the name of David. None compares to the greatness of his leadership in the Bible as a human being. The man David rose out of uh, relative anonymity, working as a shepherd boy on the backside of his father's property to become the great king of Israel. None has surpassed his greatness in leadership in this nation. And David one day was just so impressed with the splendor of the kingdom that he had built. In particular, he was much proud of his military. Anytime you want to conduct a research on how successful you are, you need somebody to count heads. You need to know how many people are really with me. And so it was an idea in the mind of, of David. You know what I want to do? I want to count. I want to count the army. I want to count the men. I want to count how many people live in Israel. I want to do a census and begin to know and have in my mind what great accomplishments I have done. So in Matthew, or I'm sorry, in First Sam, Second Samuel 24, get it right, preacher. Second Samuel 24, verse 1. The thought that David had aroused an anger in the Lord. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. So I want you to realize, all right, in the mind of God, he's creating a scenario that is enraging to God. I know this sounds strange, but, but I want you to understand that sometimes God has to create a scenario of demise and chaos. Have you ever been there in your life? It's absolute misery and chaos and disturbance. God has to create that around you because otherwise you aren't listening. Can I get an amen? amen? Sometimes God just has to create this massive storm around you, i.e. Jonah. Anybody remember that guy? Sometimes he has to create a massive storm around you to get your attention. And so in this instance, God creates a massive disturbance in Israel by creating this idea in David, go number the people to show them how awesome you are. Because it was the mindset of a country, we're awesome. Their own patriotism had overshadowed the will and might of God in their lives. So God says, I'll show you. So look now to verse 9. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king, and there was in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and in the men of Judah were 500,000 men. 
I stopped for a moment and did my great math calculations on my iPhone. Thank God for calculators built in to our phones. Listen to the size of David's army. 1.3 million men just in his army. Can you imagine being the general of an army that stands before you in mass and quantity of 1.3 million men? David was feeling pretty proud. Look at the massive army that I'm in charge of. And, you know, this guy has a pretty good resume. When he was a shepherd boy and bear and lion would try to attack his sheep, what did he do? Ripped them apart with his bare hands, the Bible says. This is no wimp of a man. Alpha male through and through, Bob. Rips apart animals with his bare hands. When the prior army of Israel that belonged to King Saul was up against the Philistine enemies, there was a giant standing between him and the armies of Israel and little David is standing there with a picnic basket that he's brought to his brothers. And he's like, what's up with the giant? How come no one has slain him? And they're like, look, David, look at the size of this guy. The reputation of the armies of Israel are on the line. He wants to fight one guy. Yeah, what's the prize? Well, you get the daughter of the king. You get to live a tax-free life. All of these are at the, uh, the beck and call of the individual that slays the giant. I'm in. That's what he says. That's the kind of guy we're talking about. A warrior of warriors. This man goes out on the battlefield, battlefield and slays the giant like it's nothing. Cuts off his head and stands before the, cheer, the cheering crowds of Israel. And throws his body to the carcasses, or to the birds, so that he, they can eat and feast on his carcass. Then there were songs that, as this guy got older, and joined Saul's army, and he would go out on raiding possibilities. This great song on the radio started to play in Israel. David, I'm sorry, Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his tens of thousands. This is a feared warrior. And so when a feared warrior like that amasses an army, think of the men that he's bringing into his council. 1.3 million fierce warriors, valiant with the sword, able to handle themselves because they've learned from David, the general, the king. This army is something to look at. But David did something terribly wrong when he numbered them. He knew in his heart that he had wronged Lord because his heart began to fill with pride, thinking, I did all of this, but you know in the back of your mind, this army doesn't exist without my God. And in that moment of perplexity, he does something, and it says in verse 10, and David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer like that? God, I've messed up. Will you forgive me? What is our expectation, church? That God's just going to wipe the slate clean, correct? Isn't that our expectation? But the reality is this, God will accept your apology, He will forgive you, but there are always consequences for our actions. Are you with me? Herein creates the storm. God says, I'll forgive you, but here is what you're going to have to live with because you have done what you have done. And here goes. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad. David's seer or prophet saying, go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I might do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and he said to him, shall seven years of famine come to you in the land or shall 
you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should bring back to him who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hands of men. Isn't that a great answer? I don't want to be attacked by men. Let the attack come from God. Let my punishment come from the Lord. And so David chooses wisely, but watch what happens. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning to the appointed time from Dan to Beersheba, that's from the northmost point to the southernmost point of Israel, and 70,000 men of the people died. So if you're keeping score and watching the math, 1.3 million has just been reduced in his army by 5.4%, and there are now only 1.23 million people in his army. Now, what has just happened to David? When you have built an army and amassed a squadron of men, and 70,000 are instantly demolished, not by enemies that oppose you, but by the hand of God. He just wipes out 70,000 people from your army. What do you think the ripple effect is into the life of David? These are families. Look, he's, these are men that are in the royal army of David. They gain their salary. Their salary pays for their family, their loved ones back at home, their housing, their farm, everything. David's got the tab. And when 70,000 wives lose their husbands to the plague, what's the ripple effect? What's, what's his cell phone messages looking like? What does his email look like back at the palace? David, what are we going to do now? We've lost our livelihoods. We've lost our, our, our men that provided and stood in the strong place for our family. They're just gone. The ripple effect is now touching David in a very tangible way. That my, my sin has touched your life. Come on, somebody. My actions are now spilling into the lives and causing chaos further than I imagined. Now it, it continues, the story continues, but this is the pressing matter that is upon the heart of David. Verse 16 says, And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it. Now this is an angel just, he intends to just keep wiping out. I'm just going to keep wiping out. He wasn't going to stop at 70,000. He was going to deplete the entire army of Israel. Deplete them one man after another, after another, until the entire city of Jerusalem, all of its warriors, everyone was demolished. But something happens in the passage. The Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aronah, the Jebusite. Something is happening in the passage. God's destruction. God's anger has been aroused. David's sin is now spilled into the camp of 70,000 other people. The destruction was to continue at the hand of the angel, but God says, stop. And the angel is standing on the threshing floor of Aryan the Jebusite. Why is that important? There is a point in which the mercy of God steps in. And a threshing floor, I don't know if you know this, it's the place where a piece of wheat, the separation of the chaff and the wheat happens on the threshing floor. That is the place of crushing. 
the wheat goes through a crushing process, and at the threshing floor, what is not necessary is removed, and what is fully necessary remains. And God says, we've arrived at the place of Aranal the, the Jebusite, and on his threshing floor is the perfect place to stop, because David, I've been crushing up to this point. And at this place of crushing, I will now remove what is unnecessary and we will keep what is of promise inside of you. Come on, are you alive this morning? Think of the calamity around your life and how it has affected other people. And God is standing above your life saying, all right, all right, Rachel, that's enough. That's enough. You're almost to the point of your own destruction, but I've brought you to this spot, the threshing floor, because there's a piece inside of you of great value, and I'm going to separate everything else that is not of value from your life. Isn't that a great work? Do you see the miracle where God stops? Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely... I have sinned and have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? In other words, why are they dying because of what I've done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. He's saying, kill me. Let them go. They're innocent. Please, Lord, strike my life and not theirs. Well, what's coming out of David now? The chaff is being removed. The seed of sacrifice. Take me. Take my life. Isn't that a beautiful moment that becomes to bud out of one's life? God, I'm ready. I'm ready. Take me, not them. I've, I've, I've done the wrong, but I repent. I'm willing to be used. Take my life. Verse 18, and Gad, the prophet, came that day to David and said to him, Go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranah, the Jebusite. Now, why is this important? As I was reading this passage, I believe what God was revealing to me and thereby to you is that out of your place of complete annihilation, complete chaos and complete destruction, the hand and the mercy of God steps in and it's at that place in your life that you give worship to God. It's at that moment. Not everything is fixed. I'm going to tell you that on the front end. It is the place where your chaos meets the grace of God. And God says, worship me there. But God, I don't know how to worship in my pain. I didn't ask you if you knew how to worship me in the place of your chaos and your destruction. That's where my grace meets your chaos, and that's where the fixing begins. Are you alive at all? I mean, this is good preaching, I promise you. I promise you it's really good. Can you praise in the place where destruction is still on your sleeve? And you're wiping the chaos off. The smell of last night is just still urgently upon you. All of it's the people, all of it, it's still a musty smell around you. And, and God says, I, I don't care what it looks like. Give me your worship in that place. Because we don't know what God's going to do in that place. He erects an altar as he is instructed, according to verse 19. So David did according to the word of Gad, the prophet, and went up as the Lord commanded. Now the owner of the property, Aaronah, looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Aaronah went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Aaronah said, why has my lord the king come here? What are you doing at my house? Isn't that a great question? Aaron has been safe in the whole matter. The destruction has been rolling up, rolling up to his property, and it stops short right there at his property, right there at his door. And he's wondering, why is the king coming to my house? I'm good here. I pay my taxes. I've got a good life. I've got a good farm. What's, 
the king doing at my house? Aronal's not privy to what's been going on in the heart of David, but he's about to find out. Why have you come, my lord, the king? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. He's saying, have you been watching the news, son? God has sent a plague. People are dying all around you. 70,000 people are, and all are dead. And God is requiring of me that I build an altar on your property. This is where the hand of the Lord brought me to, and I'm here to sacrifice, and I need to build an altar. Now Aaron all said, David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice, a threshing implements, and yokes of oxen for wood. All of these, O king, Aaron all has given to the king. And, and Aaron all said to the king, may the lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Aaron, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. This same narrative is rewritten in 1 Chronicles 21-25, and there it says that David paid 600 shekels additionally in gold for his entire farm. Now 600 shekels of gold and 50 shekels of silver, if we were to fast forward to today's market, were somewhere around 504,000 dollars that he paid for somebody's farm. Now why would he go to such extravagant price to buy a humble man's farm unless David understood something that we're not seeing in the passage? Maybe we don't know because we're not Israelites. But David is standing on a piece of property that is absolutely famous. I don't even know if Aaron knows it or not. But he's standing on a piece of property that a man by the name of Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son. He's standing on the very piece of property right here at this point. A point that according to Genesis chapter or Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 5 God says, I have hand-picked this spot for my people to worship me. Wait a minute. What's going on here? I'm telling you from the inside story that God already hand-picked this property in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5, where Aaron has a, a, a threshing floor and David is purchasing it because God says, that's where my temple will be one day. Come on, are you having an aha moment? Now, if you're going to be a part of the eventual extravagant plan of God, you have to give your sacrifice. He, he can't take Aaron's sacrifice and say, oh, it's mine. David has to buy it as the king, so that it belongs to the king of kings. Are you with me? So what will eventually be built in this location, not only the threshing floor, but the farm property itself, will be the eventual temple that David's son Solomon will build. David does the hard work of going through the crushing, the debilitating, the bone marrow crushed to the core. Moment in his life where he says, all right, God, you can have whatever you want. Build me an altar. But God, I don't own that property. How shall I buy it? At what price? Give him your best. So David gives his best. I'll give you a half million dollars for the property. And then it will belong 
to the perfect will of God. God didn't intend it to be a farm. He intended to put his temple here. Are you, are you breathing this morning? Are you sensing the gravity of the moment? What if God wants to do something amazing through you, and on the other side of it, it's bigger than you ever dreamed? It's huge. And the entrance to huge is your sacrifice. It's been nothing but chaos and death and depravity up until this point. Build me an altar here. I'll show you my grace. You give me your sacrifice and watch what I do on the other side. This is really good preaching. I'm going to try it at the church down the road and see what happens. <laughs> How does God get us there? Well, I'm not going to ro- ride on the, t- the coattails of Calvary and doing the boxes and doing the groceries. I'm going to do my own listening to God to see what he wants my sacrifice to be. That's a moment where, all right, I'm willing, God, but what what exactly will we be doing? Has anyone ever had that conversation with God? What exactly are we going to be doing? And you know what? Scriptures are real silent on those answers. Don't worry about that. Let's see if you can take one step in faith. And let's take another step in faith. And let's just watch the results unfold together. I mean, amassed on that property, even to this day, even though there's been wars and, and the Muslims and the, 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 the Israelites fight over this property, there's still parts of that temple there. And if you were in the Revelation study with us, there's still future worship to happen on that temple mount. God's plan for this farm's property all started with David having pride in his heart and God having to fix it. The temple doesn't come unless David has pride that has to be smashed. What? Isn't this how God always does it? Pride arises in our hearts. We're taught in the book of Proverbs, before a fall comes pride. So if we're, going to, if we're to do anything with God, pride has to be smashed. But what he uses is the method of absolute calamity to destroy our own pride so that the only way out is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we would have never learned about the shed blood of Jesus Christ were it not for the temple being built and the Holy of Holies being built and the understanding of the Ark of the Covenant and all of it And then a veil being put up and saying, common people can't go in there. Only the priest. Well, whoop-de-doo for you. (laughs) Until one day our Savior is dying on the cross. And the earth begins to quake. And the temple's veil is torn in two. Giving access for every worshiper to have access through to the Father. Not by acts of the law, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In which Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And the whole story starts with David's pride. Who thought anything would come of this story? Except everything comes good of this story. When you come to this humble moment, God, I can't give you something that cost me nothing. I must give my sacrifice. And if I'm willing to give my sacrifice, I know you have good on the other end. So imagine these guys sitting around in the dorm room. I don't know if they were flipping through a book, spinning the globe, and pointing. I don't know how they ended up in Ecuador. I researched. I tried to find. Where was the moment that Jim Elliott says, Ecuador, that's it. I, I, 
I just couldn't find, it's probably in there somewhere, I might have missed it, but I was reading, I read Elizabeth, his wife, I read her, her, her memoir this week, and I was just like, Where, where's that moment where they're sitting around the dorm room and say, let's go to Ecuador, because that will be our sacrifice. You know, I, I don't know if they knew they were going to die there, but I don't think they even cared if they died there. Budding, young, stars in the faith, all five of them. And God says, yeah, in order for a seed to blossom, it has to go in the ground and die. And I know we have a lot of plans. Pastor Matt and I have a lot of plans for this church and a lot of plans for you. But a lot of things have to die before they come to fruition. And I say, all right, God, if it's not us, if we're not to build it, and you know David definitely wanted to build the temple. It was urgent in his heart. You know that? And you know what God said to him? You're a man of blood. I can't let you build it, son. But your offspring will. I accept your sacrifice. Your offspring will do it. And I've always known that of the Lord. God, if it's not me to do, God, provide for me those who will. God, provide for me a semblance of ministry that understands that the sacrifice might be paid by us. And those, those little demon, I mean children over there in the children's church <laughs> might be the ones to build it. They might see the fruition of what God killed in every one of us. So we come to this moment and say, all right, what's, what do I do? How, how do I start? And look, I don't have all the theological answers that are pounding through your brain right now, but I do know that it starts with personal time with you and the Lord. God, I don't know what you want to do for them or that person or that one, but I know you have a plan for me. I know we all know Jeremiah 29, 11. I know that God has plans for you to prosper you and not to harm you and bless you. But I want to tell you, even that prophecy comes out of destruction. Their nation would be harmed all around them. And I don't know if you've ever read Jeremiah or the book he also wrote by Lamentations. Jeremiah watches complete and utter destruction go on around him as if he's a reporter on the ground with bombs blowing up around him. And he doesn't die because he knows that the Lord wants to prosper him and not harm him. I, I just want you to think of all the casualties around you and somehow you didn't die. All of the mass destruction around you and you're wondering, God, what's next? Build me an altar out of my grace. Build me an altar out of the occasion of my grace. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will give you rest. And in those moments with God, he just says, now do this. And, and what he asks us to do is sometimes like, God, are, really? It's out of the way, it's awkward, it's non-conforming to where society is. You might be canceled as a result of it. It's awkward, and God says, do it anyway, because on the other side of this, you don't even know how big it is. And I'll tell you what, God's plans will never be stymied, it's just you won't be a part of it if you don't participate. His plan moves on in the willing. And then he uses it against us in judgment if we don't participate. And so I bring all this to you to say, what's the right sacrifice? Sister Tanya, if you would come. That last chorus we sang would be excellent. But if we, if we come to this moment, we say, what is the right sacrifice? It's an obedient ear to the Lord that eventually falls to a willing heart that out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And so I don't know exactly what individually he's called you to do, but I know, I know that he's calling our church to participate with Michael Tyler. 
So this, this is a, a two-fold challenge. What will you do to be a part of this church-wide sacrifice? And additionally, my wife, we're going to talk about it and say, now what can we, what can we give so that these people in Germany can hear the gospel? Through a guy that gave up everything to go to the field and be the point man, what can we do? And as we do this together, I want all of you to do that and think, what can I give to the work of the Lord? If you're prepared to do that today, fantastic. Actually, I'm going to ask Marcia if you'll get one of these offerings and just at the back door on the way out. If you're, if you're willing to give to this today and you're ready to give to it today, you can put that in the offering on your way out. If you're not ready to do it today, we're going to be collecting throughout December as well for this project. And I want you to be challenged. But would you stand with me? And begin in your own place right there. Begin to ask the Lord, what, what do you want me to do? What is your will for my life? What sacrifice is it that you want me to give that others might hear the life-changing power of the gospel? I thank you in advance already for your gift of the shoe boxes and the groceries. Many have been blessed already. But what else? What else can we do that our Father in heaven would be glorified and the hand of blessing would come upon you? Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you. I glorify you. I thank you for your gift, your willing sacrifice that we might have life. I pray that we would take that in hand and become like-minded and be willing to sacrifice so others can receive this life-changing gospel. God, whether it's the giving of dollars or the giving of ourselves to the mission, whether it's giving in ministry here or around the world, whether it's in serving in the ministries of this church we're serving our community in some other capacity. Whatever it is, Lord, that we would say yes to the sovereign will of God as you speak it over our lives. God, I pray for a heart that worships even in the midst of destruction, even in the midst of chaos, that our hearts would be inclined to worship you, to not condemn your name, but to glorify your name that we would have the presence of mind that you are always up to something. And may we be in step with your sovereign will, O oh Lord. And Father, we ask this accomplished in your precious name, Jesus.